You may be seated. Happy to have with us today Ron Marcloff, who's our guest speaker today, and he's going to come now and bring us the message for this day. I want to thank my, uh, my hair and makeup team, Zach and, and Mike back there, for getting me ready for this service. I want to thank you for this warm welcome that we've received here this morning on a hot August 1st Sunday. You don't have to be quite so warm the next time I come back here. How's that? It is great to be here with you today. I, I know many of you, and... Uh, I've been speaking with many of your leadership over the last seven months or so as you have entered in an odd and different season in your life, haven't you? And so we're not going to get into all of that today. Um, what we're going to do is to offer you something that will be very useful, I'm hoping. And so my name is Ron Markloff, and thank you, was it Ken, our MC, for getting my name pronounced right? It's German. My family is from Germany, and I am the executive director for Venture Church Network. Some of you know that as not Venture Church Network. You might know it as Mission Mid-Atlantic, and many of you don't know that either, the old name. You know the former name, MACPA. That rings a bell for many people. Or maybe you simply know us as the Conservative Baptist Association of Pennsylvania. I go all the way back to that time, too. My father-in-law, Ed O'Brien, was the state director here uh, about 50 years ago. And so I've, I've grown up in all of this. Um, and we periodically change our name just to confuse you and keep people wondering who we are. Out in the lobby, there is a, a small poster declaring us to be Venture Church Network. Yes, we are still conservative Baptists. Yes, we still believe all the same things. We have just rebranded ourselves because we live in a day and age where certain older branding doesn't work anymore for certain younger people. I have enough silver in my hair where I have seen that, and so do some of you. Also back there will be um, a placard that just tells you a little bit of us, of what we do and what we believe, and they're all the same things you're used to seeing, but they're said in a, in a brand new way. It's been our privilege to uh, work with your church over these last seven months, and even before that, when when we go back to uh, Pastor G, uh, and when he took sick and suddenly had to, to leave. Um, and so this church has been a historic um, anchoring point for decades over here on this side of the state. And I'm sorry that we haven't been out here more often. Um, that's something I, I wish to fix. You are the furthest west outpost of all of our churches, and we stretch over eight states now. You are the furthest west. And until this January, I and my predecessor were not able to be full-time. And so I apologize that you became the red-headed stepchildren, that, that you only saw us or heard from us rarely. Well, we're fixing that. We've been out here several times now since uh, the beginning of the year and visiting the other churches that do belong to the association too. Some of them are very nearby. Some of them you have direct contact with. So today, what I would like to do is I would like to get into a passage that's very familiar probably to all of us. It is, um, it's been preached on by thousands of preachers with hundreds of thousands of sermons probably. Um, I'm not going to be able to offer too much of anything that is going to be, wow, I have never heard that before. But they are going to be good reminders for all of us when we look at this very well-known passage. Before I jump into that, I should tell you something about myself. My father's family is from Germany, and my mother's family ultimately was from Lancaster. And because I'm from Pennsylvania, I do not say Lancaster. So don't any of you say that to me either. It's Lancaster. So I, I have German and German on both sides of my family. And uh, you know, you can always tell a German. You just can't tell him much. <laughs> so. My father's family were all of the builders and carpenters. My mother's family were all of the woodworkers. I am the oldest grandson, and the grandfathers fought over me and the rest of my brothers and made sure that we kind of got both. And so I grew up in the construction business. My dad had a building business before me. 
I started my own even after I got into the ministry because the churches I served in were not able to pay us what we needed to, to live. So I did what I knew how to do in order to make money. I went out and banged nails and built things, and I did since I was a little boy. And when I was a little boy, as the oldest son, I would ride with my dad to the jobs in the summertime or on Saturdays during the school year. And so at the time of this story, I'm maybe 10 or 11 years old. And Bucks County, Pennsylvania, where I grew up and I'm from and still live, um, is much like this. It's very rural. Uh, the farms are disappearing quickly now. The farmers have figured out that if you plant house seeds on the ground, the houses will grow and they'll earn a lot of money. And so our farms are disappearing steadily. But it's not unlike what you have here. And so I'm on my way to the job, and I think it was on a Saturday morning. And um, it's about a half an hour from our house. And we're on back country roads like you have here. And we're going underneath of a railroad overpass, the kind with the stone arch that goes across. You, you with me? The kind where if you're in a stake body pickup truck or a stake body truck and somebody else is in a stake body truck, you can't go through together because of the curve of the arch. Got it? Everybody with me? All right, so we're coming up to one of these stone arches of a railroad overpass, and the road makes a hard turn to go through it. And so as we make the hard turn to go through it, here comes another guy in a stake body truck like we had, and we both have to stop. And whoever this guy was, he was younger than my father, certainly older than me, but he must have been in a real hurry. Um, because he opens the door in his truck and he yells at my dad because we're both sitting there he yells at my father what are you looking at uh, Zach can you do what you can to take some of the ring out of this for me please maybe lower the volume a little or roll off the the mids or the lows for the EQ see th this is what happens when you get a guy speaking who played in the band for a lot of years so the guy gets out of his truck and he yells at my father, what are you looking at? My father looks at me and he says, watch this. He opens the door and stands on the running board and he looks at the guy and he says, absolutely nothing. And gets back in the truck and backs up and the guy goes blasting by. I couldn't wait to get home. Mom, mom, you should have heard what dad said to this guy. He was really rude and he was yelling and he was in a hurry and, and I didn't get it at first, but the guy said, what are you looking at? And dad said, absolutely nothing and the guy never got it. So then my mother excused me from the room and she wanted to have a chat with my father. And today I'm coming asking, what are you looking at? What are you looking at? And I wanna frame this all within the passage from Mark that was just read for us, Mark chapter two. And so I'm not going to go back and reread the whole thing, but I, I will set it up this way. In Mark chapter 2, you have a really well-known story. Um, and the story is so well-known that sometimes we forget what the run-up to it is, which is this. Jesus' early ministry to the middle point of his ministry is largely in the northern part of Israel. It's a lot drier up there. It's a lot more rocky. Um, it's a lot harder to make a living up there. The Sea of Galilee is right there, and so there's an abundant supply of fish, and the Sea of Galilee is no small, I mean, it's like, almost like our Lake Erie. It's, it's big. But it, it's a rocky, stony area that yields planting hard. I mean, you've got to work hard to live up there. And Peter's mother-in-law's house in Capernaum, where the story starts, is home base to Jesus and his circle. Now, it's not just the 12 disciples. It's a whole lot of other people, up to 70 people. When he goes from village to village, he's going with a big entourage. And at the very least, if it's a close village, just the 12 guys. But home base is Peter's mother-in-law's house. You with me so far? Okay. This is a typical house in northern Israel at the time, size-wise. It's a rectangle, and I was looking at the size of your auditorium, which, by the way, is beautiful. There were several Douglas fir trees that died to make this building. You could fit about, it, it it's really is all right to laugh, and you should do it in real time so that I don't get confused when you laugh later. 
you could fit about six of these houses in this room, about six of them. They typically were one story. There's a large front room. There is a rear room in which all the cooking was done, and people slept in various spots around the house unless it was the summer over there. And summers over there are really hot, much hotter than what we have. And it was customary with these, um, they were generally not wooden houses, by the way, they were generally made from adobe brick or some sort of masonry and plastered over. It was customary for them to be one story and then a flat roof and an outside stairs because people would sleep up there in the summertime when it was really hot. The roofs were made from tree branches, probably three, four inches thick, and they were laid across from one side to the wall to the other. Then they were interwoven with smaller branches through to make a lattice. On that was mixed up what they would probably call mortar, not like our mortar today, but it was like an adobe brick slurry, and it was spread all over this thing and screeded and troweled and made flat and smooth, and the sun baked it hard, and that was their roof. So at the point of this story, Jesus has come back from being to the various villages out there in northern Israel. He's come back to home base, to Peter's mother-in-law's house. Let me stop right here and ask you something. Who wrote this book? And it's not a library. It's all right to shout out. Maybe nobody else will let you do that, but I, I am. Who wrote this book? All right. True. Mark wrote it down. Mark wrote it down. Does anybody who really know who wrote the book, and don't tell me the Holy Spirit working inside of Mark's heart, don't tell me that. Who really wrote this book? Anybody know? Sir? Nice going, Peter. Peter and Mark are buddies. Mark is very much younger. He is actually either the cousin or the nephew of Barnabas. And somewhere along the way, years before Mark and Peter are working together, and they're, they're ministry partners. Peter, at this point, is an old man. When he's dictating to Mark, sometimes known as John Mark from Acts, you may have remembered that, he's dictating stories because they thought it was a good idea. Peter, Peter you're starting to get old, and you were one of the ones here that saw the whole ride. I mean, you were there at the beginning, and you were there at the end, and you've been there ever since. It's a good idea if we start to write this stuff down. And so when you read the book of Mark, it's not in order like you have in the other Gospels. It's a bunch of stories, true ones, told by an older man to a young guy who's writing it all down. And it's why the stories in Mark jump around. You can tell that it's Peter dictating it because it's an action book. There's all kinds of action happening with it. Even the language used is action language, like the word immediately, or maybe in your King James it'll say straight away. It's used all through the book. I mean, Peter's a man of action, and as he's dictating these stories, Mark is writing this down, and you'll see that in this book. Everybody with me so far? Good. Well, you're all doing good, so I'll keep going for another hour and a half. It's all right to laugh. It's not a library. So, here we are with Jesus and the entourage coming back from the villages, and they're back to home base, and by now, Jesus' ministry is really rolling along. And people from villages that he hasn't hit yet want to come hear him, or even maybe some of the ones that he did already hit. They want to come hear him, so they come to the house. These houses typically are um, in a rectangular shape, and all the houses have a courtyard with a mud or adobe wall around them. It was to keep out the animals, keep out robbers, protect the family, and it it surrounded the property, normally not on property lines, but properties weren't real big then where the house was. They saved that for their fields and farming and all of that. So you have a house, and some distance out from the house you have this wall, and both in the house, completely packed, spilling out the doorway with people resting their chins on their, on their arms looking in the windows and out into the courtyard and probably spilling out of the courtyard gates are people. We're probably talking about 
low hundreds of people, I'm guessing. And so in this scene, Jesus is teaching. There's one other element that I need to put in here for you. And Mike, we're, we're going to skip the second screen because that was already up, and we're going to go to the third screen in just a moment. Um, the Pharisees by now have figured out that there's this new, there, there's a new sheriff in town, and they don't like it because the people are flocking to him. So the Pharisees and the Jewish religious leaders want to check this guy out. They've been hearing things. They've been hearing a lot of things. They've been hearing spectacular things. And a lot of what they hear, they don't like because the crowds aren't coming out for them. The, the crowds aren't coming to hear them teach or preach on a Saturday evening. They're not. But they are coming for this guy. And they're coming to check him out. And because Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day, the, the Jewish religious leaders, were very into public image, and wearing fine clothing and having an assistant to run along behind them to pick up the hem of their robe as they walked around because heaven forfend that their robe should get dirty. These guys take up the best seats. So they're sitting right down front because they're there to check this guy out. We don't like you. We don't know how you were trained or what seminary you went to. We're going to be here. We're going to be right here, right in the front where everybody can see us. So you probably have a certain amount of Jewish religious leaders sitting in the front in all of their finery and their little toady helpers on the side walls and then everybody else who really is there to hear Jesus. So, Mike, can we have that next screen? Here's the question. I'm going to ask a series of them. What was Jesus looking at? What Jesus is looking at from his vantage point in the front of this house He's looking at low hundreds of people with thirsty souls who want to learn because the Pharisees have closed up truth from them and made it about rules and regulations. What you wear, when you do it, when you do this, when you do that, when you don't do this, when you don't do that. There's no life in what they teach, but there is in Jesus' words, and they're there to hear it, and Jesus knows this. What else is he seeing? What is he looking at? He's looking at a whole row of Jewish leaders, detractors. He knows what they're there for. He knows that they're there to check him out. And if they can, to find something with which they can charge him or accuse him or at the very least run him out of Dodge. That's what Jesus is looking at. I'll tell you one other thing that Jesus is looking at. He's in this house. He's looking down the length of the house, out the door, and he sees a lot of people right outside the door, all the way out to the gates of the enclosure, and even beyond that. And I'm imagining that he can probably see at the way back of the crowd, there's a guy. He's, a para, he's not a paraplegic, he's a quadriplegic. Maybe your versions of the Bible say that he's a paralytic. Well, 500 years ago, when King James, using Shakespearean English, wrote that, that's what they would have said. Today, we would say he was a quadriplegic, and he's on a stretcher. He is being carried by four buddies, and they're trying to get that guy to Jesus, and they can't because of the crowd, the Scripture says. What do they do? These are smart guys. These are great friends, by the way. These are great friends. They carry him up the outside steps. They walk across the roof. I told you how the roof was made, right? They can hear Jesus underneath of them, and they kind of locate where Jesus is. They were smart, and they brought ropes. And they start to hack the roof open, and they do. Now, if you're Peter's mother-in-law, a Jewish mother-in-law, a Jewish mother-in-law, and I can say this because my grandmother was Jewish, right, from Germany, if she's a Jewish mother-in-law, she's looking at this and all this stuff falling down, and she's like, hey, 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 somebody's going to fix that before you all leave here today. You're not going to leave my roof like that. Can't you just, you know, hear this interplay? Or she's whispering to somebody if she's not actually saying it out loud. And you know what else is really funny? The guys on the roof can tell where Jesus is because they can hear his voice through the roof, so they, they arrange themselves about right over him. 
Guess who's sitting in the front row with all of their finery on? And all this stuff is falling down out of the ceiling. Isn't that great? These proud, haughty, high-minded, holier-than-thou priests lined up here, and all this stuff is falling on their heads. I love it. I love it. And they lower the man down in front of Jesus. And you know the story. He heals them. I'm sorry, he heals him. And he does it in a very spectacular way. So now, Mike, if we go to the next screen, I'm going to ask us the other question. What are the four friends looking at? When they come rolling up on the scene, what are they looking at? I can show you. This is what they're looking at. They're looking at hundreds of people with their backs turned who won't even turn around and acknowledge the neediest guy in the village that they've known his whole life who's a quadriplegic. They can't turn around. They won't see. They won't make room for him to come through to get to Jesus. The neediest guy in the village Hundreds of people won't let him through. And so this is what the four friends are looking at. They're looking at backs. They're looking at backs, and those people don't mean to shun the neediest guy in the village. They're just too caught up in their own interest in what Jesus is doing. Is it good to be interested in what Jesus is teaching? Is it? Say yes, please. Somebody say yes. It is a good thing. Is it possible that in our thirst for that, that our focus can narrow down so tight that we don't see the neediest people who need Jesus even more than you? Well, Ron, who can that be? Everybody needs Jesus. Yeah, but most of you in this room, I don't know you all, but I'll bet if I lined you all up and marched you by and said, do you know Jesus as your Savior to save you from sin? paying the debt for everything you've ever done wrong and reserved a home for you in heaven, you would say, yes, I believe that. I believed it for 10 years, 20, 30, 40. Some of you look like um, you could claim more than that. Maybe to the last century, maybe the one before that. I'm getting there myself. Who would need Jesus more than us? Somebody who doesn't know Jesus or is in a condition of this quadriplegic that needs Jesus. And what did the buddies see when they rolled up? This is what they saw. Bunch of good people in the village. They know this guy their whole life, his whole life. Nobody is, is looking over their shoulders and going, oh, oh, make a hole, get this guy through. That's not what happens. The buddies are forced to climb the stairs, hack the roof open, irritate Mrs. Peter's mother-in-law to get the most needy guy to the Savior. And that's really where I want this thing to land for all of us today. Mike, if you put the, the next slide up. So that leads us to this question. What are you looking at? What am I looking at? Are we so, so caught up in our daily lives the same routine, the same thing, day after week, after month, after year, and even in our church life, are we so caught up in that that we can't see that right outside those doors? By the way, I'm staying in, in the Hampton Hotel. It's only, what, about a mile from here? Between here and there are tens of thousands of people, and they come in and out of this town every day. It's amazing. When I was here 50 years ago, this was a two-horse town like the one I grew up in. Not today. You go down in that little valley down there, and there's every eatery that you can think of down there with dozens of people working, or at least we hope they're working because a lot haven't gone back to work yet. It's okay to smile. Don't worry. The roof won't fall in. But there's people that need Jesus right outside these walls that you and I were put in this place on Cameron Road with all these people that the Lord brought to your doorstep, you didn't have to go and find them. You didn't have to go out and knock on doors or start a bus ministry and drag people to church. That was 50 years ago. That may have worked then. It doesn't work now. God brought all these people to your doorstep and to mine. What are you looking at? What are you looking at? 
these people need Jesus more than I do, more than you do, because they're heading off, according to the Scripture, in an eternity that doesn't have a Jesus in the picture. In fact, they're heading off into an awful place where there is no Jesus in the picture, and it's going to be that way for them forever. And what has Jesus asked us to do? To stop doing this in all of our churches and our homes and our circles and to start doing this and looking around. And the reason I know that is because the last two things, I should say, the last thing, singular, that he told his disciples in two different passages, one is in Matthew 28 where he said, go into all the world and make disciples, teach them everything I have taught you, and baptize them. And by the way, I'm with you always. Then in Acts, as this, Acts 1, as his feet is leaving the ground, he said, I want you to be my witnesses, starting here in Jerusalem, and then in the county, so to speak, of Judea, and then in the larger territory of Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the world. By the way, that passage in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that I just paraphrased for you, you shall be my witnesses. Does anybody know what that word witness is in the original language in which Jesus said it? Okay, now I get to show off some Greek and show off my, my education. That word is the word martus. Martus. You shall be my martuses. You know where our word we get from the word martus? And they knew it too? Martyr. If necessary, you shall, if necessary, you shall be my martyrs to go out and tell the world about me. First where you live, and then in your county, and then in the territory, and a few of you you're going to send to the uttermost parts of the world. What are you looking at? What am I looking at? Are we so caught up in the dailiness of what we do, either at home or here or in our jobs, that we don't our hearts are not broken for all the people that we run into that don't know who Jesus is. And so, what's the point of this whole thing, Pastor Ron? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer two action steps for you after I tell you this. My grandfather was the oldest of his generation. My mother, was the, his daughter, was the oldest of hers. I am the oldest of mine. And so therefore, it was my great blessing to grow up with great-grandparents because I'm the oldest and my mom was the oldest and my grandfather was the oldest and so I knew his parents. His mother, my great-grandmother, ruled the family with grace and dignity and kindness and she was a benign matriarch and she kept track of all the girls in the family. And when one of the girls would get into trouble with something, it didn't matter if it was daughter, granddaughter, great-granddaughter, grandniece, she kept her eye on all the girls, and if one of the girls got into trouble, either they got in a scrape with their marriage, or they were financial, uh, facing financial hardship, or perhaps they were sick, or perhaps they had a baby and they were in postpartum blues, whatever it was, she kept her eye on them and she would go and visit them and put them in the car and drive them to the hospital where she worked, even as an older woman, and she would have whichever of the females in the family needed it shadow her for a day. She worked at Chester Crozier Burn Center where people would be burned in a fire that didn't have fingers or toes anymore. And my great-grandmother would attend to them or she also worked at Will's Eye Hospital. These are big Philadelphia city hospitals. She worked at Will's Eye Hospital where, where people were losing their sight or had just lost their sight. She would have daughter, granddaughter, great-granddaughter, grandniece shadow her for as long as it took. Usually it only took one day. By the time she was done, with them shadowing her, attending to these desperately hurt and sick and sometimes dying people, the troubles they were in did what? 
they shrank. It's amazing how they would come back home thinking differently about their circumstance. It renewed their hope. It made them understand that there was a God who loved them, and they weren't lying there with stumps on the ends of their appendages because they were burned off in the fire and they would only live for another 30 days. By immersing yourself in other people's needs, it makes your own circumstances and situations shrink, and they stop becoming the center of your attention. I'm standing here today on the injured reserve list. Uh, I've got a torn men meniscus, and I'm trying hard to act like it doesn't hurt and that I can walk around and I'm fine. It hurts, and I don't like it, and it's a seven-hour drive to come from my house to here, and I'm not complaining. You know why? Two weeks ago, my youngest brother, Kurt, at 60, died from cancer. What's a torn meniscus? So why did I tell you all this? It's no secret that your church is in a tough season right now. It is. And there's more tough days to follow. And we're, as best we can, we're going to help you through these tough days. It's no secret that this has consumed this whole congregation. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to stop looking at what you're looking at now and look outside of here to all those thousands of people that are all around you that God has brought to your door. The people who were, metaphorically speaking, the burn victims, the newly blind, the people who would be dying from... This is God trying to interrupt me with something, I'm sure. Thank you, that was a good reminder. There's people outside this door that need Jesus more than you do. And by being consumed by the present scrape that you're in, you're never going to get out of it. You have to start thinking bigger than you, and you have to start thinking about what can this church do to connect to what's out there to fulfill the mission God has for this church. You don't get a choice in the mission. He said, you shall go out there and be my martuses if necessary. You have no choice in the mission. The mission is to go out there and to make disciples and teach them everything Jesus taught you and then see them baptized and to do it in his name. And by the way, he'll be with you forever. There's a couple of questions that I want to ask before we get to our communion time. Mike, if you'd put them up. These are, this is your action step. What needs to be dismantled in my life? Like they dismantled that roof to get the neediest guy in the village in front of Jesus. What needs to be dismantled in your life that's keeping you from opening your eyes and looking at the right thing, all these people that need Jesus? And secondly, what needs to be dismantled in my church? Pastor Ron, what do you mean by that? We're not talking about the kind of dismantling where you take two wires and you hook them up to a box and you go bang we're not talking about that kind of dismantling I'm asking you to be creative and what would it take for this church to thoroughly engage with all these people there's a million ways you can do it you could go honor the cafeteria lunchroom ladies in your local school <laughs> nobody ever thanks them for what they do and yet they stand between chaos and life in a lunchroom, right? Nobody ever thanks them for that. All they get is a bunch of guff from teenagers or little kids, and nobody ever thinks to thank them. Go to your local school, have the Sunday school kids with their mothers and fathers, bake cookies, put them in a little plastic baggie, write a note saying, dear lunchroom lady or, or sir, um, we appreciate what you do for the kids in our public school, and we're praying for you. Put that in the bag, go with the principal's permission, go meet with all the lunchroom ladies or men and give them that in the name of this church and in the name of Jesus. It's not that hard. Go get connected to your local police force. I am a police chaplain, so I've got a real heart for this. What those men and women do, you've heard it before, they're never sure that they're coming home at the end of their shift. 
go thank them. It's easy to do. Call the chief, arrange a time where there's a shift change where you can make something for them, make treats in a bag. It, it's, um, it, it, it's a cliche to say cops love donuts. Well, you know, you can bake a lot of things and put them in a bag and put a little note in there that says, thank you for what you do to keep us safe. We're praying for you. There's a million ways you can do this out there. I want you to start to dream about it and then make the dreams a reality. Now, I know from talking to some of you that you have been doing things like that here and there. With the thousands of people that are outside and in that valley, you could, you could blow the whole valley up with all of these ideas that you could do. So thank you for what you have done. I, I have heard of some of these things. I want you to start dreaming about and doing them more. Here's something else that I know because I'm old and I have silver hair. I know when I stand in front of a congregation like this in the condition you're in right now, many of you were sitting thinking, well, Pastor Ron, that sounds good, but shouldn't we wait for the next guy to get here to begin to do these things? I mean, we have to hear what his vision is and what his plans for this church would be, to which I say, no! He'll, he'll come with a vision, whoever it is, but you were all called, I was called, serving in my church, to be doing this now. Some of you have been believers for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years you don't need somebody to come and tell you to do these things. Be creative, invent it, and start to do it. It's not hard, and it really doesn't take that much time. Go and do it, because there's people more needy than you who need the Savior. I know that sounds blasphemous. What am I not saying? I'm not saying don't study the Scripture and become more connected to Jesus. I don't want you to pray as much or read your Bible as much. I want you to be about these things. No, it's, it's not either or. It's both and. I'm not standing here saying you need to have less Bible studies and you have to have less prayer time and you have to have less of the things that connect you in a real life way to the Almighty God through His Son, Jesus. I'm not suggesting you, you ramp any of that down. I'm asking you to dial in periodically. Do it through your Sunday school classes. Do it through this new men's group. Do it through the different groups that meet. By the way, I'm tempted to sign up for this boys thing that Pastor Tyler's going to have. Sounds kind of fun. It's only $25 to $35. I also read right after that with the announcements rolling up on the wall that you have a lost and found. I lost a shoebox of 50s. So um, if you find them, you're on your honor now. You've you got to bring them back, okay? I'll, I'll share some. There's a million things you could do. You gotta get creative and start thinking about doing them. Don't wait for the next guy to come because I'll tell you a secret and with this, we're going to end. The secret is that when a church is looking for a pastor, the best guys are attracted to churches that are doing healthy things. So if you're already doing them, in your pastoral search, you're gonna make the search team's job a whole bunch easier if you are doing these things. So I'm not going to ask you to stand in place and raise your hand and throw money in the aisle. I do want you to nod your heads at me like, yeah, Pastor Ron, we, we, we get it. We don't want to be a church that's standing there doing this, absorbed in our own life, and we don't see the neediest people all around us. We don't want to be that kind of church. We want to be the church that turns around, sees them, and says, whoa, make a hole, get this guy to Jesus. You want to do that? You want to? I want to see you do it. As best I can, Venture Church Network is going to help you do that. I appreciate your having me on a hot August Sunday. Thank you for this. It was a pleasure to meet a lot of you. Um, have it not be such a warm welcome the next time. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you that you are very clear in your love for this world. You loved us all. You didn't want any of us to end up in a place separated from you in the next life when we're done with this one. And so you provided a way to fix our sin problem and our death problem because of Jesus. And I pray now that, that you would allow us to turn around and look at the people all around us that need you because they don't know you yet. And we don't want to see them head off into 
an eternity that doesn't have Jesus in the picture. Thank you for these good people. Make them sturdy and strong. Allow them to be forgivers. And allow them to be the kind of people that when I say, what are you looking at? They'll say, we're looking at a whole valley of businesses and restaurants and all kinds of people that serve to make this community better and we're going to get connected to them and bring Jesus to them. May that be so, I pray, and it can only happen by the power of your Holy Spirit. And I'm praying in Jesus' name. Amen.